introduce our third panel of witnesses. Mrs. Mistrella, welcome to the committee, who lost family members in a car accident involving a Toyota vehicle. I want you to know that you have our deepest sympathy and uh, I know how tough it is when you lose a loved one. So I want to let you know thank you so much for coming. Uh, Mr. Haggerty experienced a sudden unintended acceleration in a Toyota vehicle. I can, I can imagine you know, what that's like. So we want to thank you too. Uh, imagine that experience, you, all of a sudden your car just takes off. I can imagine. And uh, Mrs. Claybrook, a former administrator of the National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Administration and President Emeritus of the Public Citizens, uh, of course, welcome. We're so delighted to have you and your experience that you could sort of share with us. Uh, yes. Uh, and Mr. Ditlow, the Executive Director of the Center for Auto Safety. We are delighted to have you with us as well. And so what we would do is just start with you, Mrs. Lestrella, and just come right down the line. Um, and we have five minutes. And of course, the, um, when you start out, the light is on green. And then it turns to yellow. And then, of course, uh, then it becomes red. Uh, red everywhere means stop. <laughs> So we will start with that. Mrs. Lestrella, why don't we just come down the line? You start first. Yeah. I'm sorry, but let me close the door. And I have to swear you in, too. Yeah, let me just do that. Will all of you stand, please? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Issa, and the members of the Congressional Committee, thank you for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to speak for my four siblings. To testify with Toyota recall as they relate to my beloved family who were taken prematurely away from us. I would not discuss or talk about the accident as we have heard enough. We have heard so much from the media anywhere throughout the world. I'm here to speak for my four children and for the safety of the consumers throughout the world. I braved this time myself. I would like to introduce myself. I am Faye Lestrella. I am a school teacher by profession and I ventured into the real estate business when we moved to Vallejo. Nobody knows probably where Vallejo is. That is a suburb from San Francisco, California. We moved in 1979 or 77 to Vallejo, but we were in Alameda for quite a while before coming to California, we were, my husband was stationed in Midway Island. So I was married to Cleto Lastrella for 46 years. He was a retired command master chief, U.S. Navy, for 30 years and worked for the federal government for another 10 years. We have five children. The oldest one was Kyofi Lestrella Sailor. Chris Lestrella, the middle of the five, who was with them, who called and dared to call 911. 
As I mentioned earlier, I will not discuss the accident. So let me start with Cleofi. Cleofi, when she graduated from University of California, Davis, she worked for her immediate boss for a year and research department. Then she worked for Carl Jean, in which she has, and I went to her experiment the cell. I know I only have five minutes, but I'd like to mention this because she had that experiment in which we didn't mention the cotton. It was presented by the president of Carl Jean on TV. And then she worked for various pharmaceutical and technological um, companies. And the last one was Ambrex in La Jolla, California, in which she received an achievement award for significant technological innovations awarded to her in October 2009. Mark Wesley Saylor, her husband, was a highway patrol officer we love so dearly. He was respected, very respectful person and very caring. He was a person of honor and integrity. He was a very religious man, a devout father and husband. He gained respect from his colleagues and friends. Mark dedicated his time in life to his family and to his job. In 1997, he responded to a traffic collision in Interstate 5. He saved the life of a man who was trapped in his car, burning car, and he was awarded for that too, for his effort and for his superior act. And it is ironic, he saved someone, but he was not able to save his family from the fiery cross in Santee. Mahala Manda Sailor. That's my 13-year-old granddaughter. She was a promising athlete. He loved her love for soccer and her, made her the team captain. Mahala was so blessed for a parent like Mark and Cleope. After working hours, her parents would attend to her games, to her practice, to school, and to church. The week of the tragedy, my daughter Cleofi took off for a week to prepare her daughter entering ninth grade at Mater Dei Catholic School in Chula Vista. Mahala missed the invitation and the opportunity to travel as she was invited by the sports ambassador, people to people, soccer cup in Vienna, Austria. Knowing Mark and Cleofi, they will make an investment on their child's future. That's Mahala. Excuse me. Chris, New School Estrella, Passion was basketball. He graduated at St. Vincent's St. Patrick High School. He worked for the United Parcel Service as loading supervisor. After his graduation in college at the University of um, East Bay, now East Bay, that was University of California, Hayward. He went into the financial mortgage uh, business also. 
as we encouraged because it goes hand in hand with the real estate business. So he ventured into that. While doing that, he worked for Wells Fargo Mortgage Company. While doing that, he went to school for voice acting in San Francisco, in Sausalito. Chris' voice was heard over because of his practice in, he was so composed when he said, when he was the one that called for 911, and everybody heard it. I have not heard it. I, I stayed away from it. I don't want to hear the rest of it. And the message was strong. He answered to the operator to hold on and pray, pray, pray. That was very great of him, the courage that he had. I know it was the four of them were in the verge of their deathbed. And he was able to call 911. And I thank him for that. On August 28, that was the tragic date that triggered us all. But we didn't hear about it until the following morning when the law enforcement officer came to our door with a note to contact the coroner's office. And I said, oh no. How could you imagine coroner's office? And what does that tell you? So was it only my daughter? Because I know my daughter always checks herself, her experiments on weekends to see how they are doing. That's how dedicated she was. So when we heard from the cop that there were three of them, and I said, how about another person? And I was so glad that there's another person somewhere that was not with them. But then when we called the coroner's office, there were four. Could you imagine? unimaginable to lose some four people in your segment, in your sibling. So I brave this moment. So hopefully, Mr. Chairman and the committee in the different organization, the Department of Transportation in NHTSA would do something for the safety of the world. We don't want another person, another family to suffer like we are suffering. I have, we have, a, at the time, we have a 17, a seven month old baby. His name is Connor Toyoka. Toyoka, my Japanese um, son-in-law. We were talking to him. I know he's bubbly all the time, but he would not even smile. That's how the impact of the tragedy was felt in my household. It had a big impact on my friends and family in the whole community in San Francisco area, in the San Diego area. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I know I didn't come here to cry on someone else's shoulder, but as I mentioned earlier, it is for the safety of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lestrela, for your very moving testimony. Um, Mr. Haggerty. Um. My name is Kevin Haggerty, and I own a 2007 Toyota Avalon. In the past six months, I've experienced five events where my car accelerated on its own. The first few times I experienced a car accelerating without my foot on the gas pedal, I was driving through town. The car, would, the car would go back to its normal RPMs after driving a few miles or after the car was stopped, turned off, and restarted. After experience, experiencing the sudden acceleration the third time, 
I took my vehicle to be checked by my local auto body shop or auto shop. They could not find anything wrong with my vehicle. After two more incidents, I brought my car to a Toyota dealership on November 11th, 2009 to be checked. After keeping my car for two days, they found no unattended acceleration problems and confirmed that the factory mats were prop installed properly. Then on December 28th, 2009, I was driving to work on Route 78 in New Jersey. The car began to accelerate without my foot on the gas pedal. As I pushed on the brake, the car continued to accelerate. At that time, I was not able to stop my vehicle by pressing on the brake pedal. The only way I was able to slow, slow the car down was to put the car into neutral. I got off the next exit, which was the exit for the dealership. Determined to get the car to the dealership, I showed them firsthand that this was, uh, I wanted to get it to the dealership to show them firsthand that this was happening. I drove approximately five miles by alternating from neutral to drive and pressing very firmly on the brakes. On my way there, I called them and asked for the service manager to meet me outside. As I pulled into the front of the dealership, I put the car into neutral and exited the car. With the brake smoking from the excessive braking and the car's RPMs racing, the manager entered my car. He confirmed that the gas pedal was not obstructed, the mats were properly in place, and that the RPMs were very high. They contacted a Toyota tech to come to the dealership and look at my car. He arrived within a few hours. The dealership had my car for one and a half weeks. When I was told the car was ready to be picked up, I asked what problem they had found. I was told by the service manager that, per Toyota, they replaced the throttle body and accelerator assembly, including one or two of the sensors. Since they could not tell me exactly what problem they found with these parts and why they were replaced, I started doing some research about Toyotas online. I came across Sean, Kane, Sean Kane's name in multiple, art, in multiple articles I read and decided to contact him. When I reached him, I explained my situation and expressed my fear of driving this car in light of what just happened. I no longer felt safe in it since nobody could explain why the acceleration problem occurred in the first place. Sean did not have an answer for the cause and was surprised that the dealership replaced parts and witnessed it firsthand. I was then contacted by ABC News and they were interested in doing a follow-up story on accelerator problems. ABC also confirmed that Toyota, um, excuse me, ABC also confirmed with Toyota that the parts taken out of my car were sent to Toyota's corporate offices to be evaluated. I, agr I agreed to an interview mainly because I wanted to help people understand how to safely stop a car by putting it into neutral. I continued driving my car out of necessity but refused to put my children in it. Children in it. About three weeks ago, a local dealership owner, after hearing about my story, made me a generous offer on a new vehicle, as well as offer to pay off the balance of the loan on my Avalon. For my safety, as well as the safety of my family, I took him up on this offer. And I just, just want to confirm one thing on this, um, on my statement is, I explained the first couple times that it happened, I was able to apply the brake um, and slow down the car, but I was going at a slower pace. I was going 15, 20 miles an hour through town. When I was on December 28th, when I was driving at a faster, at a uh, faster rate, at you know, 60, 65 miles an hour, I was not able to stop the car just by applying the brakes. And the only way to stop it was putting it into neutral. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your your testimony. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mrs. Claybrook. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I would like my whole statement in the record because I am not going to have time to read it. Without, without objection. Thank you. I just want to highlight a few things and try not to be repetitive of other things that have been said today. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The um, uh, first thing I would like to mention is that I do believe that uh, Toyota uh, has um, harmed its uh, trust and confidence of the American people and uh, particularly with the, uh, the document that has been mentioned at this hearing. Uh, um, one of the things that concerns me enormously is that there are no criminal penalties uh, in the NHTSA statute. And I'm concerned about that because the Consumer Product Safety Commission has them, the Food and Drug Administration has them, the SEC has them. Um, for in an article in the New York Times recently on foreign bribes and, and misleading, uh, a company paid $400 million in penalties. 
uh, and uh, has the threat of going to jail. So uh, the penalties at this agency, which total $16.4 million maximum at this point, are way understated for the size of the companies that, that this agency is regulating. And so I hope that, that this will be something that will be taken up uh, by the committee. Uh, and uh, as a recommendation, I know you're not uh, doing the legislation, le legislative part. Uh, I'd like to say for the for the people who have been victims of this, and, and Marcy Kaptur was very articulate about it. You know, the, really the only remedy that they have, other than getting a new car and trying to forget the horrible experiences and loss of family and friends, is a lawsuit. That's really their only remedy. That's the only way that they can punish individually punish Toyota, and uh, so that even that really isn't a punishment. It, because it's just a, a financial penalty, but it's not really a, pe a penalty for the people who made the decisions. That's the reason that I, I'm interested in criminal penalties. Um, I would like to mention something about NHTSA and the revolving door. There are 28 former top officials of this agency who have gone to work for the auto companies in one capacity or another in the last uh, 25 years. Former NHTSA administrators, several of them, former chief counsels, former deputy administrators, uh, top engineers and lawyers of this agency have become the uh, face and voice of auto manufacturers after they've left the agency. And they've left it way before it was time not for Not just the, Toyota, but a different companies. Not, no, uh, not, not Toyota, but all, okay. all these companies. Right. Uh, Toyota mm -hmm. has had several, but, but I'm talking about all of the companies. So it, it's not a small issue when people raise it. I just wanted to make sure that you saw the scope of that issue. Um, this, been a, a discussion of, of Toyota secrecy, and I just want to say that this I think this has less to do with their culture in Japan than it has to do with the fact that they're an auto company. All the auto companies are secretive, and uh, so it, it's an issue that is uh, is really crucial. And so is NHTSA. NHTSA is very secretive, and Clarence Ditlow has filed probably more Freedom of Information Act requests to NHTSA, and Public Citizen, where I was the president, have litigated more of them than you can possibly imagine for no good reason. And I do think that that's something that this committee may want to take a closer look at, is how secretive this agency has been. Um, one of the things that really uh, got my goat was one I read in the um, October 5th filing by Toyota on the floor mat recall, that October 5th, uh, 2009, is that they claimed they were doing this, but it wasn't a safety-related defect. Please. Sudden acceleration isn't safety-related. I mean, it was so arrogant what they did, and it, it was so unbecoming of a company that should have much more sensitivity than that. Uh, um, the, uh, the other uh, uh, action that they took, which I, I found very disappointing, was that they hired a litigation expert company to supposedly evaluate whether or not they have a, a problem with the um, electronics. And in fact, the whole purpose of this company is to defend uh, manufacturers. Um, in terms of NHTSA, I would just like to ask you to get more details about the financial information, because here is their budget document filed by the agency for, in this Congress. And what it shows is that of their total, of their total um, budget, only 15 percent is for motor vehicles, only 15 percent. The vast majority of it, 71 percent, is for grant and aids to the states, and another 13 percent is for highway safety research, and only 15 percent is for vehicle safety of the total budget of this agency. And so when they say they have 66 new positions uh, coming up or that, that they have, uh, they're going to ask for more money, where are they going to ask for this money? Where is it going to be? And so I hope that, that there will be a, uh, a question asked about that. Um, uh, the last sort of major point that I want to, and, and by the way, um, this agency is the poor stepsister in DOT because the 95 percent of the deaths in transportation occur on the highway and they have 1 percent of DOT's budget. So it is a very grossly underfunded agency and has been for far too long. Uh, a lot has been uh, mentioned about the event data recorders. I hope that you will follow up on that. Uh, I don't even know whether or not Toyota has looked at the event data recorders for the crashes that you have been hearing about. Have they looked at the, what the, the event data recorder said for the crash we just heard about or for the, uh, the other 38 deaths and all those injuries? Uh, they haven't made it available easily in the United States. I'll bet that NHTSA doesn't have that data. And that would help to, to uh, elaborate 
what actually happened in those crashes. And it wouldn't be he said, she said, it would be factual data. And then the last thing is that um, the, when the Firestone uh, Ford Explorer debacle happened 10 years ago, the Congress passed a new law called TREAD. And in there, it required early warning systems to, uh, to be established by the agency, which it did do. But it keeps it all secret. This is not transparent either. Uh, all of the information is kept secret. So if you have a problem and you go to see whether or not a company has given information to the agency about that particular make, model, vehicle and what the problem is, that's all you can find. But you can't get the number of consumer complaints. You can't get the number of warranty claims. You can't get the, um, the uh, information about their field uh, activities. So, and they don't have even, even have the number of lawsuits filed in that particular case. So you're really disabled. And I hope that this transparency issue uh, will uh, come, uh, become a, a key concern of this, agent, uh, of this committee. And then lastly, I'd just like to say that some new safety standards do need to be issued. And I've got them in my, my thank, statement. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. Mr. Didlow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, sudden unintended acceleration has always been recognized as a serious safety hazard. In 1971, uh, General Motors recalled 6.7 million Chevrolets for defective engine mounts that caused sudden acceleration. That's the fourth largest recall ever. Uh, <clears throat> but the early sudden acceleration recalls, they were mechanical in nature, easy to detect, easy to fix. Um, with the advent of so electronic you have your mic on? Uh, controls, is it your mic uh, up? Yeah, it's, oh, it's open. I want to pull a little closer. Okay. With the, with the advent of electronic ignition and cruise control systems in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, we began to see uh, complaints that, that didn't have a mechanical nature. They were hard to find. Uh, in January 1989, and this is a fundamental problem with, uh, with NHTSA's logic, uh, the Department of Transportation's Transportation Systems Center did a major study into sudden acceleration and concluded that absent of finding a defect that could cause the throttle to open, uh, such as a failed cruise control, uh, it must have been driver error. And in investigation after investigation after investigation after 1990, the agency took the position that they would close the investigation without a defect determination or recall if they couldn't find a mechanical problem that caused the throttle to open. Uh, beginning in 2001, though, the game changed uh, with the introduction of electronic throttle controls. Complaints at the Center for Auto Safety, NHTSA and Toyota, went up fourfold. Uh, NHTSA, during the, after that, NHTSA re received five defect petitions. They opened three preliminary uh, evaluation investigations and two engineering analyses. But none of these investigations resulted in a single vehicle safety recall. Uh, what happened, uh, the investigations as a whole, though, show significant weaknesses in the, NHTSA investiga in the NHTSA enforcement program, which Toyota exploited to avoid recalls until the tragic crash in San Diego that took the lives of Mrs. Uh, uh, Lestrella's family. In the defect petitions, uh, most consumer complaints were excluded because they were long duration events or where the driver uh, said the brakes could not bring the vehicle to a stop. Not a single defect petition resulted in, in any recall. In the most crucial investigation, which was engineering analysis 07-010, NHTSA commissioned a, a study, a technical study and a test at their Vehicle Research Test Center in Ohio to determine whether it was electronic controls or floor mats that caused it. Uh, we, we FOIA'd NHTSA for the results of that test because their conclusion was it's only floor mats. There are, there's no electro, uh, EMI interference, there's no electronic control problem. NHTSA responded to that FOIA by saying they had, uh, they don't know how they did the test, they don't know what they measured, and they had no test data. In other words, they had nothing other than a conclusion. Now, as an engineer, which I am, you keep lab books, you enter the data, you enter the test procedure. NHTSA had nothing, and yet that, uh, invest, that report was what uh, enabled NHTSA to do a uh, equipment recall of the uh, Lexus. But look at that equipment recall. It resulted in 55,000 vehicles, or floor mats. It was designed to fail. 
the, the failure, the completion rate in the recall, as Representative Issa was interested in earlier, was 40 percent. 60 percent of the masks still have never been replaced. Uh, the only other investigation that resulted in anything was a safety improvement campaign. What's that? That's not even a safety recall. It's just something where the manufacturer says there's no safety defect. We're not going to even uh, comply with, uh, be subject to the Part 573 and the Safety Act re uh, requirements. And so when we look at all this, from 2001 to the October uh, 2009 format recall, which was generated by the San Diego crash, not by an investigation, not by anything else, all they got was an equipment recall, which Toyota told uh, in its internal memo that it saved the company $100 million. The other thing that we have filed a FOIA for is the early warning system. After TRED, as Joan indicated, Congress established an early warning system. It was supposed to prevent more tragedies like Ford Firestone. It didn't. We have been told there are hundreds of investigations under early warning. The agency won't even give us a list of the investigations. Now, we have a number of recommendations for moving forward to improve this process. And here's what needs to be done. For NHTSA, it needs to require all responses and investigations to be sworn. Just simply say the information in here is truthful under penalty of perjury. Not a subpoena, just a, a statement, uh, uh, an affidavit that is true. Make the early warning investigations uh, public. Make the, uh, the minutes public. Uh, revamp uh, and revise the, uh, the NAS system so we have more crash investigations to find out what happened in crashes. And finally, they need to do a, 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 a comprehensive evaluation of electronic controls and adopt safety standards, including the requirement that every vehicle have brake override. And for, for Toyota, we just have a few uh, recommendations. First of all, uh, install the brake override in all their vehicles and f uh, open up their public records in these investigations so we can see. And finally, for every consumer who files a complaint, and there's only been 2,500, Give that consumer a report and an evaluation on what happened in their car uh, and uh, tell them what they did to fix it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, start off the questions. Uh, Ms. Claybrook, um, what would, uh, you know, you told the committee staff that um, there, all of this seems to represent a failure of regulation. What, what's been wrong with NHTSA's approach? Uh, to the is issue of um, a sudden unintended acceleration? I think they lacked leadership. I don't think there was an enforcement mentality. This agency is a cop. It's a policeman. It should mm -hmm. act like a cop. Mm -hmm. And if it's not popular, that's just too bad. You mm -hmm. know, they should be a cop. And I think that there has been great improvement since Secretary LaHood took over and uh, David Strickland. But for the past decade, uh, there were one investigation after another closed, no real explanations. Um, the agency is grossly underfunded. It never used any of its subpoena power. It rarely hired an outside consultant to help it. Uh, uh, it uh, didn't put out public alerts. Uh, Twenty, you know, 30,000 complaints that, uh, that Secretary LaHood talked about. When I was there, there were 200,000. Why were there? Because I put out consumer alerts all the time. I asked the public to come in and tell us about things. We had 23,000 complaints on one Ford defect. Because the, and we valued those consumer complaints because that's the richest, freest information you'll ever get on what's happening on the highway. And this agency has just been, um, I don't know whether it's been beaten down or just didn't care or whether, you know, it just um, it didn't have any enthusiasm, but it certainly didn't have any leadership. There was no caring by the top staff of that agency that says, tell me what's going on with these, give me a weekly report. I want to know every case that, that's happened. I want to know the number of deaths. I want to know the number of industry injuries. And let's put out some consumer alerts to alert the public. And on the early warning issue, the fact that public citizen had to sue twice, had to sue the agency twice in the mid-2000s uh, in order to even get just the, the, the vehicle and the make model vehicle and the, um, uh, the, the problem put in the public record. It's ridiculous. This whole program was meant to be public. And if the public knows what's going on, they're going to tell you, as you've heard today. They're going to give you information that is rich and the agency should have to do its job. You know, the, uh, I'm sure you heard the testimony of uh, Secretary LaHood. He said that they were uh, trying to bring on uh, 
66 uh, uh, new employees, I, I assume, to do uh, to follow up on some of these uh, complaints. Um, from what you know, do you think that's uh, sufficient a number of folks to bring in and to do what they need to do? Well, uh, no. Uh, the agency has always been understaffed and underfunded. Uh, when I was uh, administrator and, and, and how, administ when, when were you administrator? Uh, in the Carter administration? Yes. And when I was the administrator, the, uh, we had 119 employees in the entire enforcement office. Today there are about 30 less than that. Uh, and that's for standards enforcement as well as for defect enforcement. Uh, so uh, there are only 18 investigators in the defects office for the whole country and all automobile uh, defects. And there is uh, only 57 employees just in the defects office. So <laughs> the, the agency does not, is not enough. But the key issue to me is how is it going to be, how is it going to be allocated? Mm -hmm. Because as I mentioned to you, 71 percent of the money this agency gets now goes in grants to the states. Only 15 percent of that money, which is $132 million a year. That is the total budget for the entire uh, motor vehicle program at the Department of Transportation to do research, to set standards, to do uh, litigation cases that they have that come up, uh, to uh, investigate defects, to investigate uh, safety standards. So uh, this agency is, gr I, I say it needs another $100 million minimally right now. And um, I, I also think that it needs to be able to impose penalties against companies in that range as well, because $16.4 million is chump change to Toyota. Now, Mr. Didlow, uh, you said that NHTSA has relied on outdated sudden acceleration uh, study. Is that right? Yes. And how do you think that's affected them? I mean, they so they're not up, up to date with regard to that issue. Uh, are they? I'm sorry. Uh, not up to date. Yeah. No, they're definitely not up to date on on sudden acceleration. I mean, they did more in studies in 1975 and 76 than they have since uh, that uh, since then. Uh, the only study that they did was one that was uh, aimed at showing that it was driver error that was causing sudden acceleration, not electronics. Uh, there, there are twice as many vehicles on the road today, and the vehicles are five times as complex. Mm -hmm. The job is enormous, and the budget and their staffing and resources are down. I see. There's a, if there is a message that you want to deliver, Mr. Haggerty, what would that be to Nitsa and you, Ms. Lestrella? What would your message briefly be? I beg your pardon? If there was a message that you want to deliver to NHTSA, what would that be? Close investigation, full capacity of investigation mm -hmm. by NHTSA. Secretary? Yeah. I, I think they need to take the investigations more seriously. Um, I was contacted by NHTSA um, from uh, uh, Scott Yan, and he, ex he seemed very interested in my case. Um, he also copied several uh, other people on his agency. Um, he also mentioned they may be interested in taking a look at my car, see if there's anything else that may be contributing to the acceleration problems of electronics, and they really want to dig into it. And, and they seemed very interested, and I never heard from him after you know the one conversation we had. I even expressed, sent him an email telling him that uh, uh, I was planning on selling my car. Um, if you're interested in taking the car and, and taking a look at it, you know, please let me know. And I never heard anything back. So I, I just wish they take the, some of the complaints very seriously, and from the dealership on up. You know, once they, they get a complaint from the dealership, to contact Toyota and take it seriously and, and really dig into it and find out, you know, how what the crust of the problem is and how to correct it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that the uh, prepared written statement of John Saylor, uh, the deceased father, uh, be placed in the record. Without objection. Mrs. Lestrada, once again, our condolences. I, uh, I had an opportunity also to be asked to pass on, again, a deep regret from Bob Baker, uh, the elderly 50-year uh, car dealer who simply was the unfortunate owner of the dealership that uh, provided the loaner car to your daughter and, and son-in-law. There are many victims uh, that we are dealing with in this tragedy, this group of tragedies, but none touches us in San Diego more closely than the loss of your family. 
we are here today, I think, uh, trying to get to the bottom of an agency's failures. And Ms. Claybrook, uh, I'm deeply concerned that uh, the agency that you administered back in the 70s has become complacent. And I'd like to be fair to them, and I'd like to run just a line of questioning and then talk about some of the things that should be done to revitalize it. Uh, in 1975, uh, a study was done uh, just before you became the administrator that estimated that about 50 percent of all auto accidents were alcohol related, 93 percent of all crashes were directly or indirectly related to the individual drivers, uh, and approximately 13 percent were mechanical or vehicle related. And in those days, as you and I recall, a lot of cars were driving without even automatic self-adjusting brakes and most had drums. So no surprise that vehicles were more a part of it. And there were 51,000 uh, 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 deaths in 1980, the last year of your administration, and uh, that was 3.35 per thousand. Now the good news. Today about one-third of all fatalities are estimated to be alcohol related. Uh, in 2008. There were 37,261 fatalities, even though our population has grown greatly. And that's about one per, uh, that's about one, th one per 1.27, I should say, per thousand or, uh, you know, actually, uh, yeah, so call it, and about 2 percent of automobile uh, fatalities are estimated to be directly related to the vehicle failures meaning we have gone from 13 percent where the car is at fault to 2 percent. Ms. Claybrook, I believe that probably a lot of what NHTSA is dealing with is the fact that cars are simply a lot better and less likely to fail. And what uh, Mr. Ditlow has said is they are also harder to find those failures when they occur. You heard Secretary LaHood uh, earlier today uh, answering questions about transparency of the agency, uh, looking around the world so that this problem or problems that had been detected and changed differently in Japan, detected and, and dealt with in Great Britain sooner than in this country, and had they been done, no doubt in my mind, your family would still be alive. Do you believe, first of all, that the Secretary is going to be able to make those changes within the budget and the present constraints, if you will, of the law, and if not, what we need to do to help him make those changes. Uh, thank you so much for your question, Mr. Issa. Um, there is a lot of information in what you said. Um, well, I, you know, the, I don't want to yeah, mislead people. Cars are safer, but they are not as safe as obviously they could be if the agency you once shepherded was doing a better job. And there are also different things. For example, there are 10,000 rollover deaths a year. Uh, that virtually didn't exist when I was uh, the, the uh, administrator because we didn't have SUVs and as many pickups. We had long gas lines then, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I issued the toughest fuel economy standards you'll ever see, and Lee Iacocca can tell you that. Uh, um, but uh, yes, um, there has been a reduction in deaths and injuries, and, and it is actually a little bit lower right now because of the, the recession. If you look at, at the economy and deaths on the highway, they sort of track each other. But um, uh, I think that the vehicle safety standards that we have, uh, particularly airbags and seat, seat belts now that are used by the vast, vast majority of the public adults, uh, have made a huge difference uh, in the safety. And uh, the campaigns that have been launched and the laws that have been passed on drunk driving have made a huge difference uh, in, in that area. And those are big, big issues. Uh, I still think that there are a lot of issues that, that haven't been addressed in terms of safety standards. And, uh, and then we have uh, in the defects area, for example, in the Ford Firestone case, there were over 200 deaths in that I believe that the 34 or 39 deaths we know about now in, in the Toyota case is probably going to triple by the time all the information comes in because it, 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 a lot of people don't tell you that it happened. In terms of big changes, um, I think that the agency needs a lot more money. Uh, it uh, has a uh, I think a meager budget for the for the work it's required to do, and as I said, I think it needs a hundred million dollars more. And I know that that's maybe pie in the sky, but I think that there ought to be that ought to be the goal f fairly soon. Um, secondly, um, the agency collects data in a, a very old-fashioned way. Uh, it collects data by doing acts investigations, SWAT teams, as uh, Mr. Toyota said. 
but they were supposed to collect uh, huge numbers of crash data, maybe 20,000 crashes a year. They're now only under the funding able to cl collect 4,000. The reason I focus so hard on the event data recorder, the black box, is because the black box could be not only the, the liberator of um, information about what happens in particular crashes, it could become the data source for the agency, and very inexpensively because it's quite accurate, and so it should be mandatory, it should collect a lot more data, and that data should automatically go to the agency. And if it did, then they could take that $20 million they now spent on crash investigations and do analyses and, and fill in, in little gaps. So there are some very special things that this agency should do uh, right now, and I believe that, um, that my testimony also elaborates. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, I would ask just to be able to ask a question for the record very briefly. Uh, Secretary LaHood was, uh, let's just say, not completely uh, prepared to answer the questions related to when we do a recall, how few actually in the ordinary course get implemented versus people get the letters, they don't see the significance and they get, they get lost. Uh, would you answer for the record your view of obviously then, now, and how we could change that? Well, it's about 75 percent, 74 percent. Uh, that's the, the, the best. We never have 100 percent. Uh, the newer the car, the cheaper the, the fix, the more likely there is to be a recall and the higher the returns are, except in examples like this, which are so unusual, where people are scared to death, so they bring the car in to get it fixed. Um, the agency does get quarterly reports, uh, I mean, um, yeah, quarterly reports for six quarters after a recall is announced, so it knows what the progress is of uh, the company in getting these cars fixed. And it can extend that. It can also require the company to send out a second letter. It can also require them to do advertisements and other things like that to publicize it if it's particularly uh, needed. Uh, I think that one of the key issues is how the letter is written to the consumer. And in, when I was administrator, I reviewed all those letters. And they had to say, alert, safety, you know? Now they're sort of smudged down and so that they don't, uh, as some people say, they don't scare the consumer. I want to scare the consumer. I want them to bring that car in and get it fixed. So, and it's also how the dealer reacts to it. Sometimes the dealers are underpaid. And when they're underpaid, then they, they make that the last thing that they do. Sometimes the manufacturers don't make the parts on time. So the letter goes out and you can't get your car fixed for six months or four months. And so people then don't do it. <coughs> so there are a lot of factors. And I, I think that there was a, an, an investigation by the Inspector General of DOT in 2004, I would commend that to you to look at, Thank you. in which he uh, talked about this process, the early warning system, uh, and getting um, the, the defects office activated. And, um, and I think that maybe another IG report on what NHTSA is doing and could do to uh, enhance the, the uh, repairs of these vehicles would be very worthwhile. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They meant that for the record, but thank you. Thank you very much. And let me also again thank you so much for your, your testimony. Uh, let me um, begin by asking you, uh, Ms. Claybrook, and also Mr. Ditlow, um, NHTSA missed many warning signs regarding sudden unintended acceleration. Further, it appears that the agency was caught completely by surprise when Toyota began a series of recalls. I thought these problems were solved after the Ford Firestone fiasco, uh, but clearly they were not according to this. Um, what specific changes must be made at NHTSA so we don't see this again? Well, is it know, a resource you know, issue, or well, is it a lack of commitment, or it's a, they, they, they just hope that things will just sort of go away and they won't have to deal with it? Well, I think it's a wonderful phrase that uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And I think there are some changes that could be made, but I think it's a leadership issue. I think it's uh, whether or not there's an interest by the administrator and the secretary and an insistence that uh, this uh, part of the agency be well funded and that there be weekly reports on exactly what's going on with all the defect cases they have so that the administrator knows that some cases have been pending for two and three years or they've been closed without a real, really good explanation for why they were closed. So I, I think that, that part of it is administrative. Part of it is transparency. 
if this stuff was all up on the, on the Internet, if it was easy to find, their web page is disastrously difficult to use. The, the early warning system doesn't even summarize things for you. So you have to spend hours digging through it to try and find anything out. If the agency helped with the, the transparency so that a person like Mr. Haggerty who has a problem could go easily to their web page and find out if other people had had that problem, then there would be the ability of the citizens to push harder as well. And also the Congress would know. You know, your staff could, could check it every week. What's the progress of this agency in doing its job? So I think transparency is a huge issue. I think criminal penalties are a big issue because that puts an incentive to the manufacturer not to get caught and have to go to jail. And when executives know there are criminal penalties in the statute, they behave differently. And I think there needs to be a heavier penalty and there needs to be better funding. Now, in, in addition, the agency used to publish monthly press releases on all the pending investigations that went out to the, the media with a summary of each one. They need to uh, redo that again. The agency used to make uh, public the names and addresses of consumers so you could contact them and get information like, are the form were the formats in your car? Uh, there's a checkbox on a, on a complaint form for the manufacturer to get a complaint, but there's no checkbox on that form for the, for the consumer to make the entire complaint public. We'll make that clear. This is a form filled out by the consumer. Mm -hmm. And so they would say, yes, it's okay for you to make my name public. They now say it's okay to send it to the manufacturer, but here they'd have to say it's okay to make it public. And then, as Clarence says, no. we could have called Mr. Haggerty or whatever and found out whether no. he had formats. There's case after case in the early days where we got expanded recalls by going to the consumer and rebutting the information that the manufacturer had put in. Uh, and, and the only way to do that is to talk to the consumer. But if you can't get to the consumer, you can't do it. There needs to be a, re a restoration of that check function of the uh, outside public to look at what the agency is doing. The agency wants to operate behind closed doors. And one other thing is minutes. They have minutes of meetings with the manufacturers where the only thing you see are the list of the attendees. They should be required to have detailed minutes of what went on behind closed doors with the manufacturer in right. investigations. Right. Let me ask you this. In response to a letter I sent to Toyota, regarding the possible causes of sudden unintended acceleration. Toyota cited a report, and of course, as to why it did not believe that an electronic malfunction is to blame for sudden acceleration. Uh, is this a serious study? And do you think its methodology proves that the sudden acceleration problem is not caused by an electrical malfunction? Is this the exponent report? Th that's correct. Right. Well, uh, I don't think it's a serious study, and Toyota has now said that it's an ongoing study. Um, this is not a company that I would go to if I were seriously interested in trying to find out the answer to a problem. This is a company that Toyota went to to justify what it did, and that's the purpose of this company. That's what it does. It why wouldn't you go to it? Why? I don't know why they did it. I guess they were in a defensive mode. And yeah. um, the mo normally what this company does is it protects companies that are sued in pro product liability litigation. That's the purpose of this company and the, or a large part of it. And so that's what it was attempting to secure was justification for what it had done. If it was really seriously interested in a fresh approach and a fresh look, I, I think it could have gone to a lot of other people in the United States, including Mr. Gilbert, who testified yeah, yesterday. General Motors once hired the same firm to do an analysis of fuel tank fires in some uh, GM vehicles. And they did a mi such a misleading analysis that the president of General Motors had to make an apology for the fact that the study was misleading, that they didn't intend to mislead the agency, but in fact they did. Wow. Yeah, and then I can understand your response, Ms. Claybrook. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. But let me just say to you, too, um, Mr. Haggerty and to uh, you, Ms. Lestrella, you know, um, um, when I hear the situation that occurred, I mean, uh, this is the reason why it's just so important that we really continue to push to make certain that these, this is corrected. Um, because listen to you in terms of in losing family members and you in terms of Mr. Haggerty, that must have been some experience when you uh, have a car accelerate on you like that. And then you receiving that phone call, Mrs. Lestrella, I can imagine, you know, uh, how you uh, felt at that time. You know, um, but so we want to let you know that we're going to stay on this and continue to see what we can do to try and get to the bottom of it. And thank you again, Ms. Claybrook. Would yeah. I only make a comment? Yes, you go ahead. Okay. 
Um, regarding the, the acceleration as far as the sticky pedal, I just want to make a note that it, the first or second time that it happened, I was able to slow down the car and I stopped it. You know, I turned off the engine and turned it on again to reset itself. Um, and when I brought it to the dealership after that day, driving to work, you know, the, the, when I was driving to work when it was accelerating and I couldn't, the only way to stop it was putting it in the neutral, um, they really didn't know what the problem was. And they never determined that it was a sticky pedal or it was a defective pedal. I would probably have been okay with that if they said, here's the problem, we found it, this is defective, we fixed it. But that's not what happened. They put, you know, an accelerator pedal in, a throttle body, and and, and replace the sensors and, and send them out to be tested. And I don't think they even knew themselves. And they would had the car for a week and a half. They brought specialists in, and I, don't, I just really, my heart, don't feel that they knew exactly what the problem was. And if it was a, a sticky pedal or, or if it was stuck in any way, I believe, and you'd have to talk to the mechanic, but I believe his, he had spoke to some other people that he turned the car off and then it reset itself. So just by knowing that information, I just hope they look into that as well as one for right. my car particularly. I hope they look into that and make sure that that Thank maybe, you. you know, just Thank you. take a look at that seriously. Congressman Chafee, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a brief question. There was some discussion about Exponent, the, the company, and they were evidently the uh, the organization used to uh, investigate the uh, Columbia crash, the space shuttle. Do you, do you care to comment on that? Are you suggesting that they have that same type of uh, reputation and that that investigation was flawed? Uh, I don't know anything about that, so I can't answer that question. I can only say that, um, that, that in um, the automobile area, where I do know something about them. I mean, you just kind of tore a company and their reputation apart, and yet you're I'll, willing to I'll, give them I'll, the deference I'll, on I'll the space shuttle? I'll take your criticism and limit my comments to automobiles. Yeah, yeah. In the automotive area, every uh, they've done a half a dozen major defects where they've come in and found that there's no defect, even though there's been a recall in many of the cases. Is there any reason to think that they're any different on space shuttles versus air aircraft? I mean, what's well, the they probably have different people working on them, and uh, they may be different if they're working for. How the big company. a company? I mean, I just don't know how big a company it's is a this. Pretty big company, and uh, it may have um, uh, a different uh, mode of operation when it's working for the government than when it's working for um, uh, manufacturers. So you th you'd question what their motivation was, kind of behind the scenes. What are, are you suggesting that? we should go back and reconsider the work that they did in other areas or? Well, I don't know that you want to do that, but um, I, 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 I don't mean, that's know. a pretty I mean, serious I, I, allegation. It's, and it's my a allegation pretty big disaster in the history of our country. So I, I have no idea, as I said to you, about the space program. Yeah. I have no idea at all. And, and, and so going back to what you do know, is that from your own firsthand experience? And well, that's from my reading and understanding and talking to lots of different people and knowing a lot about what the agency's done and what they've said about these defects and looking at cases. Would you be willing to share with the committee the people that you have garnered this information from so that we can further investigate what, why we would be so critical, why we should question their well, integrity? You, you probably don't know, but I just retired as the head of public citizen, and I sent 450 boxes to George Washington University of every file that I ever had on auto safety to start a new library there. So, and they're piled up in some room out near Dallas Airport. So, I don't know that I could supply you with much of anything. Maybe Clarence, however, yeah. who is still working in his you, job. You, you just files. you bring a wealth of information and perspective that yeah. many of us don't have. Well, this is we we're brand new to this. So well, maybe we no, could do I, it together, and, and Clarence yeah. could pull from his files. I have nothing. Yeah, to I would be glad to submit for the record a book by a retired professor from Yale, Leon Robertson, who looked into a number of uh, different uh, cases where that failure analysis was involved in. Uh, and I think that's much broader than just the automotive area. But I personally have looked at their reports on Firestone tires, their reports on uh, GM uh, fuel tanks, uh, and uh, several other uh, automotive investigations. And I'd be happy to provide information on those. I, I think this committee would appreciate your helpful input. I mean, you're two very credible witnesses uh, uh, giving us a perspective and calling into question the very core of the integrity of people who we've relied upon for some of the biggest disasters in, in our country. So to the extent that you can further help the committee with your insight and perspective, at least gui guiding us and giving us direction or documents that you may be aware of, you know, I, I, when you have a company that is uh, borders 
uh, as questionable conduct and, and uh, um, integrity. Uh, I don't know that you necessarily draw that well. They're really good on space shuttles, and I, so I, we appreciate your testimony, your perspective, and I guess that's why we bring it up. Is it's a serious charge, and, and uh, we'd like to explore that further. I think okay. we'd be negligent if we didn't. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back his time, and I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I had a representative of Toyota visit with me in my office to uh, uh, deliver this exponent report. Uh, I noted a couple of things when I looked at it. One is that it was, uh, exponent was retained in December 2009 to uh, look into these reports and claims of unintended acceleration. December 2009. Now, they, they looked at, uh, over a period of one, two, three. It looks like they focused on three years and looked at uh, three different kinds of uh, models in three years. It was a very small sample. I, I just want to point out the, the sample they took was very small. Uh, it would be interesting to pair that sample up with the complaints that came in to see if there's any similarity. And, uh, you know, none of us are interested in smearing anybody here, but if a company has a reputation, according to LATimes.com, California engineering firm is known for helping big corporations weather messy disputes. Okay, well, Toyota has more than a messy dispute. Uh, I want to submit this LA Times article for the record. Without objection. And uh, so ordered. I, I'm more interested in, you know, th this issue that I raised before about why did Toyota order a software design in 2005? Um, now, Mr. Ditlow, I read your testimony, and uh, you heard the presentation that Toyota made. Uh, is Toyota's representations that it's uh, unlikely that it could have been an electronic throttle com control, uh, is that credible based on the information that you've seen, that you've studied at the Auto Safety Center? No, uh, when we, what we have done is we've examined the complaints that have come in. Can you, can and you speak closer to the mic? I'm sorry. We've examined the complaints that have come in, and when you have a complaint that comes in and there's no floor mats in the vehicle, there's no sticking gas pedal, uh, and the driver uh, clearly has a foot on the brake uh, to the extent that the brake, uh, uh, the brake system is uh, scorched and trying to stop the vehicle. What else is there other than electronics? Right. Well, see, that's the thing. When Mr. Haggerty, when you're prepared testimony, when you brought your uh, vehicle in and it was still running to the max, you had it in neutral. Mm -hmm. They checked it out. It wasn't a pet. It wasn't a floor mat. It wasn't a pedal. And then right. they uh, uh, determined that it was the uh, electronic throttle. They, they don't, um, they're not sure. Well, they, don't, they don't necessarily they don't admit know. that. They, they replaced but a they, bunch but of they parts. Replaced they, didn't, it. they never got back to me and said, we know what the problem was. All they, they kept coming back with was per Toyota, they told us to replace these parts. See, so I have I, to tell they, you, They Mr. don't know, and that's why I didn't feel comfortable See, taking it See, you know, Mr. After. Chairman, this whole hearing, which has been a very important hearing, um, I, I feel like we're trying to, we, we've, we're still at the point of trying to grasp smoke here. Well, not only that. Because, because uh, hold on, uh, yeah, okay. Ms. Claybrook, because I don't think Toyota has been forthcoming. I think that uh, they've made a, uh, it's good that uh, Mr. Toyota was here. That was remarkable. But I, I don't think they've been forthcoming. They seem to have blinders on about this issue of electronic throttle control. Uh, for whatever reason, could be liability, could be that there's a link to a cover-up. I don't know, but there's... The thing doesn't fit here. You know, if you have a missing piece when you're doing an investigation, you have to keep asking questions. So, Mr. Chairman, despite the fact that this committee has put in a very long day here, I'm thinking that there's going to need to be a follow-up where we'll sift through the testimony, we'll look at all the evidence that we've gathered so far, and we may have to take uh, one more uh, crack at this 
uh, because the, the testimony by Toyota officials doesn't square with evidence that has been produced to this committee and doesn't square with evidence that uh, it's, uh, is available to experts in, in the automotive industry. <coughs> now, Ms. Claybrook, you wanted to make a comment. Well, I just wanted to add to your collection there, which is that they're also putting this electronic brake override <coughs> in the vehicles. Talk, that, speak closer to the mic, okay? I'm sorry. They're also putting the electronic brake override in the floor mat recall vehicles. There are two recalls. The, the one with the sticking pedal is low impact, low speed generally. But the floor mat recall, which most people don't believe is a floor mat because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, there, are, in most of those vehicles, they're putting the the brake override, and they're putting the brake override. It's an electronic brake override to to, to uh, override the accelerator, the throttle, and that's an electronic software change that they're making. And so you're still going to have the problem, perhaps, of having a, 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 a accelerator that slams to the floor, but you're going to have a brake override which will stop it. Now. Normally, if it was a floor mat problem, you fix the floor mat. Why are they putting the brake override in addition? They say they're exactly, doing it exactly. for well, the Mr. comfort Chairman, of the people. My, right? my time has expired, but I just want to say thank you for your diligence in pursuing this, uh, Mr. Chairman Towns. I also want to finally express my condolences to uh, Mrs. Lestrella and your family for the suffering that they've endured, and to all those who uh, are watching to, uh, and trying to determine will their families be safe. Uh, our job is a very serious one to pursue this. And I want to thank each and every one of the witnesses for their uh, presence here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me also thank all the witnesses. And I really appreciate you, your being here and to say to you that safety is the issue that we're really pursuing here. And thank you for helping us to do that. Thank you very, thank very you, much. Chairman. Thank you. This committee is adjourned. You've been watching the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee hearing on Toyota vehicle recalls. It's one of two hearings on the issue this week. You can find both hearings on cspan.org. You'll also find written testimony, related government documents, as well as viewer reaction on Facebook and Twitter. That's at cspan.org. Tomorrow we'll have live coverage of President Obama's health care summit. The president meets with congressional Democrats.